Addiction comes in many guises, from painkillers to tobacco, opioids, alcohol, tobacco, and addiction. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Addiction has been with us since history began. Today, addiction can be defined as a variety of terms, such as being addicted to the internet, but the addictions from chemicals and drugs we put into our bodies is often the most devastating to one's life. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Tobacco use in the United States is highest in A, the South, B, the Midwest, C, West, D, Northeast. We'll have the answer at the end of the show. Joining us tonight are Dr. Craig Uthi of Sanford Health and Dr. Josh Clayton, the state epidemiologist from the South Dakota Department of Health. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Great to be here. So addiction uh, is different than habituation, is different than dependency. Mm -hmm. Can we get into the definition? Who wants to take that? Josh? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously uh, addiction is a much more severe form. Um, you know, when you're talking about somebody who uh, is using or abusing um, drugs, medications, things along those lines. Um, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of, lot you can say about, um, you know, addiction really being that next level. Um, it's something that we need to really prepare for uh, and work with individuals so they don't reach into that realm. That's right. And then dependency, if you look at that, that's, uh, what is that? Well, drug dependence means that your body is dependent on a, a substance to have an effect. And when that substance is taken away, you'll have symptoms. The most common symptoms would be withdrawal and tolerance. And which means, uh, tolerance means you have to take more of a drug to get the effect that you want to get from that. And withdrawal is if you don't have it, you feel symptoms. It might be shaking, it might be nausea, that type of thing. But if you're taking the drug the way the doctor prescribed it and you're being dutiful for that, you may be dependent on the drug, but that doesn't mean you're addicted. Addiction is, the difference between addiction and drug dependence primarily is a person with addiction goes out and seeks the drug in a way that's going to be harmful to them. A person that's drug dependent may depend, but they're taking it the way it's been right. told them to take it. But it's interesting because when I remember my mother, mm -hmm. I was a little boy, what is this heroin thing? Oh, is it bad, bad, bad? Because if you stop it, then this terrible, horrible feeling comes over you and you've got to have more of it or you, or you will have that terrible, horrible feeling, that monkey on your back. And uh, I remember thinking that was the, the key, that was the thing. The drug dependence is the thing, and, uh, but it isn't. It isn't at all. I mean, take gambling. That's a horrible addiction, but there's no withdrawal, right. mm -hmm. uh, except that's an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, as, a, as a primary care physician, I would say 80% of what I do every day or did every day when I was in full practice had to do with uh, the emotional side of all that we do. What would you say, Craig, in your practice, you're, you're in the middle of a full-time practice, how much of, of emotions is part of your practice? Well, a huge part of it. Uh, mental health is a very, very important part of any kind of uh, health care program. And what we're seeing now with health care systems is we have what's called integrative health care specialists who are behavioral health specialists. They're now embedded in primary cares because there's so much of an overlay of the mental health piece of person's health and disease. If a person has diabetes, their ability to take care of themselves and respond to their diabetes is dependent upon their mental well-being. And we do know that people that suffer from an addiction, over 50% of the people that have alcoholism, drug abuse, dependence, likely have an underlying mental health condition like anxiety or depression or previous trauma. I mean, if they didn't have it at the beginning, they certainly go into it. But sure. my sense is that the mental health problem probably is a big part of why they go into sure. or get into the addiction. Let me give you an example. Person comes in and says, Dr. Uthi, I'm depressed. And I find out that they're drinking a six pack of beer every night. 
and I say, well, do you know okay. what alcohol is? Is alcohol a depressant or a stimulant? And usually they'll say, well, it's a depressant. And I'll say, well, I could either put you on an antidepressant, a pill for your depression, or we could have you stop drinking the alcohol and have you come back a month from now. Because I have a strong suspicion that your depression is not really primarily depression. I think it's the depressing effect that the alcohol is having on your system. And guess what's the only way to find out if it's the alcohol or not? Uh, you have to stop. Yes, to stop it. <laughs> to stop it. Uh, I would say that uh, the, the other big category is that same story I've heard a number of times. It wasn't the six pack of alcohol, it was the Ambien and the Ativan and the Valium kind of medications. Do you, do, what does the public health department feel about the benzodiazepines? Have they had a particular? Oh, it, the, you know, the use of benzodiazepines is actually an increasing area of concern for us. Um, you know, it has been a primary focus around opioids and the prescription medications and so on. Um, now what we're actually seeing is uh, co-use of uh, opioids and ben benzodiazepines, um, which increases the risk for overdose um, for individuals who take too much. Um, so it is an area that we have to be cognizant of and an area that we have to um, look into. Uh, I know that you know, there's a, a lot of work to be able to monitor some of this. Uh, you know, we have a, a prescription drug monitoring um, program and you know, that's a, a, a piece of software that uh, all docs who are prescribing benzodiazepines and opioids uh, push information into. Uh, and we can, we, that helps us identify individuals who might be at high risk and, and, and who we really do need to reach out to. Um, and it also helps, um, you know, as a feedback mechanism for physicians uh, to know, you know, how many uh, uh, opioids they're prescribing, at what levels are they prescribing, uh, to, to make sure that they're able to provide uh, the adequate level of care to their patients, um, but, you know, not to have um, uh, some of the ill consequences that might occur from overdose. Yeah. I, the, the benzos, uh, I, I just, uh, I came out of medical school right when they went, oh my gosh, what have we been doing? We've been just putting it in the yeah. water. Mm -hmm. And everybody was dependent on it. And then we'd finally get somebody off of it because yeah. it's really hard to get people off of those medicines. Well, when we talk about benzodiazepines, we're talking about Valium, Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin. Those are the, the drug names that people know Ambien, well, brand names. Pills. Ambien. All yeah. of those, are, some of them, mm -hmm. they'll say, no, they're not officially benzo. No, they're benzoactive. Right. So they work in the same receptor. And, yeah, and, and they're just, uh, the, the most common thing it's prescribed for is anxiety. Well, we're all, right. we all have a reason to take benzo then, right. basically. But what happens when you stop it? You have withdrawal anxiety. Yeah. And you go, oh my gosh, I need to have more of that out of it. In March of 2016, the Center of Disease Control came out with 12 recommendations for trying to curb the opioid crisis. Yes. And one of them was patients should not be prescribed benzodiazepines and opioids at the same time. So if you are a patient that is on both of those, uh, you should go and talk to your doctor and say, I just heard that I should not be on both of these meds. What's your recommendation? Yeah. Um, if a person's on a benzodiazepine, we recommend not just stopping it. It can actually be dangerous to stop well, a benzodiazepine. I had a guy seized turkey. for three days. <laughs> it can be dangerous. <laughs> it's terrible. Mm -hmm. You've got to be very slow in the taper, yeah. and I taper very slowly on the benzo. Yeah. But, you know, um, if you combine an uh, opioid with a benzo, then you're going to make the mechanism of death from opioid overdose uh, double. Yeah. And, and what is, what that, is me that mechanism? Yeah. Well, the respiratory center for breathing is shut down. And a person dies from stopping breathing, asphyxiation. Basically suffocate. Yep. Yep. You lack the oxygen. So. They talk about this Narcan drug that's out on this, uh, that's now available. Um, the first um, line that comes to, to rescue, uh, when they come to uh, a person that's unconscious, if they give them Narcan, it is an antagonist to those medications that have caused them to stop breathing. And it just displaces that drug in that respiratory depression center, and literally in 10 to 15 seconds, it they wake saves up. lives, literally. It's just being able to get there in that four to six yeah. minute. And it's an old drug, so it's relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Not no. really. No. Um, the mechanism of delivery it makes it more expensive. It's inexpensive if you can draw it up in the syringe and give it intramuscularly, but there's a nasal spray that's more expensive. 
Um, we do know that they have them available in some communities, um, first responders, police force, some schools actually have it. Maybe so even places we are getting it people more who are on doses of yeah. this stuff should have it maybe in their home. You can be a family member of a person that has an opioid addiction and you can get a prescription and have it in hand. So um, you don't have to be the person that has the disease. You can be someone that's a, a good Samaritan and have it available. And have, have it available. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I'll say it again, I'm, it burns me, it just makes me very angry that the pharmaceutical industry taking this old drug has just shot the cost of it uh, as high as it can possibly mm -hmm. uh, do. So it, that's one more reason why we have health care cost issues in this country, that they're allowed to do that. Any other political comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> Not a political comment, but I, I mean, I will say that uh, use of naloxone is really a game changer. Um, you know, having uh, our uh, EMTs um, in the state having access to that, uh, our paramedics, uh, our first responders, uh, and the Department of Health has done a lot of work um, to do training for those individuals um, to work to make sure that that uh, source of naloxone is available to them. Um, because, yeah, uh, anyone that you're coming into uh, uh, taking care of, uh, if they're unconscious, one of the first things that EMS will do is to provide that um, dose. Uh, if they're unconscious and then we know for sure it's not a mm -hmm. narcotic opioid. Yeah, opioid. if they don't opioid respond to it. Yep. They will respond within 30 seconds and if they don't, it's not an opioid overdose. Yeah. So opioid and narcotic are the same, we're just going to just interchangeable. Opioids, opiates, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. narcotics, we might as well just call them the same. They're all controlled substances that have that same effect. They, they, they go to the mu receptor that's a pain receptor in the body. It's interesting, you know, I had a patient who is this big, huge man, 25 or something, and he was just unconscious in the Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And I said, I want Narcan. And, um, and so she said, I'm bringing some people in before you give him that in injection. And when I gave him that injection, he came up out of his, <laughs> ready to choke me to death for taking away his high. That powerful review, uh, reversal of the mu receptor. Mm -hmm. But the other interesting thing about Narcan is that they were doing big studies about placebo effect and a standard pain, and they went across the board, you know, Tylenol, narcotics, aspirin, you know, all the different kinds of pain medicines. And then they, they, um, they, and placebo. And placebo was, you know, 65% effective. And then they took the Narcan and they injected it and it reversed everything, including it reversed the placebo effect. Oh my goodness, wow. <laughs> so that the fact is that our brain relieves pain mm -hmm. with belief and trust yeah. and faith. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an interesting? Mm -hmm. interesting. <clears throat> Breaking the hold of addiction often means a significant life change. Few can accomplish this on their own. They need the assistance of outside support. There are a number of organizations that offer a hand up. You know, we help men with life controlling problems. So often it tends to be addictive uh, issues, addiction issues, addictive uh, behaviors and substance abuse issues. Uh, but we do a lot of work with the courts. You know, it just kind of happened that way, whereas the judges and the public defenders and probation officers know that, that we're uh, providing a long-term answer to these big life controlling issues. And before their students here, sometimes they're criminal offenders and they're in trouble with the courts, but it's nonviolent, uh, criminal conduct that's basically related to their addiction issues. Our program is 16 months long, so there's a 10 month um, first phase, if you will, that uh, the men come in right from the streets or uh, a rehab or a prison or jail, and um, they're discipled here, they're, they're mentored here, uh, they learn who they are, how to act, uh, self-discipline's involved and after the 10 months here the men go to downtown to our old location which has been renovated 
and that's where they have the re-entry phase, which is a halfway house type of structure, and they're there for six months. So there they get a job in the community, they handle a budget, they prioritize, we help them to um, deal with real life problems. One of the first things I let uh, potential applicants know is what we believe, right? So uh, we're Christians, we're gonna go by the Bible, we're gonna trust that the Word of God is relevant as we believe it is and, um, and we know right away if we have a common ground in terms of faith and what we're offering. The curriculum at Teen Challenge is, is designed to help them build their character, help them face reality, help them take responsibility, apply biblical principles to everyday life, you know. So what they're learning is not so much to not do the bad stuff or the wrong thing, we're teaching them the virtues of doing the right thing and the positive aspects of being um, you know, a, a good citizen in the community, being a solid family member. Uh, being, we help the men gain vision. We help them understand that they can prosper. We just started to partner with um, Sleep in Heavenly Peace building beds for kids that have no beds, which I just am amazed to find out that that happens right here in Brookings. But So we, we help them. When it snows, we usually take a bunch of dudes with shovels and go downtown and shovel the businesses. And they love us for it. And, and I'm telling you, the guys do it with a great amount of zeal, which I'm really proud of them for that. You don't eat an elephant with one bite, right? The, as the saying goes, you, you take it one bite at a time, so to speak, and you you just, um, you don't quit. And I think that's one of the big messages here. Well, thank you, Mike, for that fabulous uh, story. And of course, all of the service that you provide in our community, and particularly for those boys, uh, those men who are, who are caught in addiction and, uh, and escape uh, to responsible, uh, wonderful lives. Uh, we're, we've talked about opioids uh, in particular, and I, I'd like to talk about opioids, some more about the danger in opioids in South Dakota, deaths, numbers of deaths, what's happening with opioids in South Dakota. So we are seeing uh, increasing number of opioid deaths in, in South Dakota. Uh, unfortunately, last year we had 35 individuals um, who died um, using opioids. Uh, 28 of those were unintentional, um, and so that's really where we are focusing um, our efforts. Uh, the majority of those 28 um, individuals were using prescription um, drugs uh, at the time that they died. Um, we, do ha we are seeing increasing use of uh, uh, the illicit drugs, illicit opioids that are out there. Um, you know, heroin has kind of always been in the background, uh, and you know, we haven't seen a huge increase of that. Um, but what we are, what we are seeing um, is the use of uh, synthetic uh, f uh, fentanyl. Um, it's coming over from China, probably. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is then, sourced out of China. And then this this elephant fentanyl, it car is, fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a real danger too. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this is a chronic illness, this opioid. People get caught into it and they can't get out. M most addictions are really a chronic scenario. And I'm glad you bring that up, Dr. Holm, because it's um, no different than diabetes and hypertension. People don't choose to have those illnesses. It's the same way with addictions. People don't choose to become an addict. They have a vulnerability and it becomes an illness and it's a recurring remitting illness. Uh, there can be people that are in recovery for a year or two and have a relapse. Well, people have diabetes. They do very well and all of a sudden they have high sugars and end up in the hospital for a period of time. Some very similarities. It's so dealing with the person that's suffering from addiction, and it's really suffering. They really need compassion. They really need to have patience. Not easy. Yeah. And an understanding saying, you know what, if, if, if you have a relapse, brush yourself up, get back up, and we're here to help you. How right. can we help you in your recovery? So, but the, the majority of these deaths that we had in South Dakota are from prescription. In other words, somebody's writing a prescription for them. 
And so the onus the, is on the doctors, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right? the PAs, nurse mm -hmm. practitioners, dentists. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, w what are we doing about that? There's some risk factors that go along with the addiction. If a person has, like, for example, sleep apnea, you're at a higher risk to have an unintended opioid over overdose death. Is, let's say it's Friday night, and it's a person that's 60 years old, and they're diabetic, they have sleep apnea, and they're taking five or six opioid pills, and they also take a Xanax to help them sleep at night, and they just happen to drink a bottle of wine that evening. That, that combination they're gone. is going to lead to them dying. Now, no one's intentionally doing that, but I don't think the patient is aware of that that additive effect is, is possibly there. So, uh, and I think this whole uh, sleep apnea story is one that's really something that's happening. It comes with overweight. We are gaining weight in this country, uh, and we don't understand it really. And we can blame the lack of exercise. We can blame the fast food, but uh, it may well be that it's the way we're, we're feeding our children. Uh, we just don't understand it. Um, uh, but I think that we we've got to try to figure out what we can do to help rather than to go. Blame, 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 blame. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what about other addictions? And I mean, of course, uh, what are the most common addictions in the United States today? What's the number one common addiction, Josh? Tobacco. Uh, you know, tobacco use um, is so prevalent, in, in, especially in South Dakota. Um, you know, we see about 55% uh, of the population, uh, you know, uh, has. You know some sort of uh, cigarette um, use and and that sort of stuff. So it, that is something that we need to be very um, conscious of uh, as we talk about addiction because um, you know that is is very pervasive. Um, you know, second to that is alcohol. Um, you know, we have a high uh, a high use rate of. Um, of alcohol, uh, <clears throat> and actually I got my numbers mixed up. Uh, alcohol use is at 55%, so I apologize for that. Um, and uh, uh, tobacco use is about 18-19% uh, yeah. um, in South Dakota. And in the rest of the country, we're about the same? I mean, 18-19 is, is maybe on the higher side? Uh, for South Dakota, for tobacco use, um, we are a few percentage points higher than um, what the we average. see for as far as the national average. Right. Uh, we're very much in line um, in terms of our alcohol um, consumption. Um, uh, with the rest of the with country. the rest of the country, fifty five percent. Fifty five percent for yeah have for consumed alcohol within the past thirty days. Okay, it's kind of the forgotten sibling with the opioid uh, crisis that's been going on. So right. much attention has been brought to that, but many many more people die from alcohol related illnesses than they do from opioid related um, uh, encounters. So again, alcoholism is highly uh, prevalent, both binge drinking mm -hmm. and dependence. And um, colon cancer, breast cancer um, are tied somewhat for higher risk for alcoholism. You think of it as being you know, related to other things, but it's also related with alcoholism. So there is some uh, long-term effects that are negative from alcoholism besides alcoholism and liver disease. Right. Well, and then I, I, always, I always wanted to go back to tobacco. You know, I was thinking, well, I mean, people are dying, suffocating from opioids, but they're not suffocating from tobacco. Well, yeah, they, yeah. they end up with yeah. long-term <laughs> yeah. suffocation. You, I've, I've just seen it and seen it and seen it. It's just a terrible kind of a Nicotine is a highly, highly addicting substance. And so when a person becomes addicted to cigarette smoking, um, e-cigarettes is another issue that's out there. But um, there is help. You know, in South Dakota, we have the South Dakota Quits Line. You know, yeah, S let's, see, let's yeah. show that Quit Line on the, on the screen. We do have uh, the, uh, the Quit Line, and uh, it is highly addictive. The danger with, uh, with the smoking, though, seems to occur in the youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get past mm -hmm. 21, 22, yeah. mm -hmm. you don't seem to be, get into cigarettes, but before mm -hmm. that, that's where they get hooked. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and there's a really good reason for that. Uh, a lot of the tobacco companies, uh, as they go into retail settings, uh, will put their marketing front and center for you kids. know kids to see. 
uh, you know, it's very int very telling that um, about 82% of uh, kids between 12 and 17 years of age know what e-cigarettes are. Um, and our usage, uh, their usage in that population um, is much higher than the general population as well. Vaping, 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 vaping the, narc mm -hmm. the, the nicotine. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's safer. Yeah, them, right. But, yeah. <laughs> and it's twice as addictive because it, you can sneak it. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of science behind quitting smoking. And I've had people that are highly successful, very um, controlled individuals, they have everything together and they are unable to quit smoking. And they know somebody else that just decided one day, you know what, I'm not gonna smoke anymore. And they quit, and the, the, my patient comes in and says, how did they do that? And I said, well, there's about 4% of the population to 7% of the population that can quit cold turkey. For the other 95%, it takes a lot of work. And that's where that South Dakota quits line can help. There's nicotine replacement treatment there's a patch, there's gum, there's these lozenges that there's can be worked. There's certain medicines yeah. that makes you... Uh, Wellbutrin, likely. an antidepressant, bupropion as the generic name for that. I like found that to one. be highly effective in combination with other things. So if you call that quits line, talk to your primary care provider, you should be able to get some help and, uh, and really have a good chance to quit smoking. Most, most everybody who has successfully quit quit about 10 or 20 times before they finally got it. Right. You got to keep going you at gotta it. You can do it. You can do it. I know that <clears throat> some of the nicest people I know have been or are smokers and there's some not so nice people that never smoke. So there's, it has nothing to do no. with whether you're a good guy or not. It has to do with how hard it is on your body and your family Yeah. Mm -hmm. too. Uh, uh, let's talk about behavior addictions, uh, gambling addictions. Uh, we see that here too, don't we? I mean, we see it everywhere. Do we have data on that, Josh? Uh, unfortunately, that's not something that's easy to track. Um, you know, we see the outcome of individuals who die from opioids or uh, the long-term outcomes of uh, tobacco use and so on, but uh, gambling addiction is not something that um, is easily tracked. So, um, you know, we don't have any data at the health department on, on gambling addiction. Mm -hmm. We do know that in the brain there is this release of dopamine and it's in the midbrain that overrides our thinking processes. And so what happens is a person hears those dings, they see those brit blit britsy lights that are at uh, um, the casinos, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason they do that, part of it is, is there's a, something that really releases that dopamine in the vulnerable population. We don't have a blood test that we draw and says, oh, you have a risk for gambling addiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is a person becomes addicted in the sense that they go and they do something that just doesn't make sense. They don't necessarily want to do it, but they keep doing it even though it has significant negative consequences in their life. So it's, it's, it's this. How about, how about little kids doing uh, this the playing war? Be the I same mean, thing. look at them. I saw an advertisement yesterday that, <laughs> holy Toledo, I would want to fly that airplane through that battle and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. How addictive is that? Do we have any data on that? We don't have data on that. We don't, we don't have any data on that, but it is, I mean, it is yeah. highly mm -hmm. addictive. I mean, you look at uh, young kids, um, they're growing up in this digital age, uh, and they're exposed to it at a very young age as well. And so, I mean, that, that sort of um, exposure, um, you know, prolonged exposure uh, over the years, and it's no wonder that the individuals yeah. have um, difficulty putting their cell phones and iPads down. Yeah, I, I have to say that in our household, we did not buy any of those devices. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it saved them because they would go over to their friend's house and <laughs> right. of course we were the bad people and then they would go, you know, voracious. Right. And I remember, I'll have to admit, mm -hmm. I had a comic book addiction. Okay. I read, I had, they'd come <laughs> flocking in my house because I had every comic mm -hmm. book, every Superman, mm -hmm. every, you know. <laughs> Well, again, if, if it tends to be a problem in your life and you try to cut back and you're unable to do that, that's a problem. And that's where you want to go see your physician and say, you know what, hey, um, I heard on TV that um, uh, drinking too much is a problem. Well, I tried to cut back and I'm having a trouble cutting back. Mm -hmm. I'm a gambler and I'm, I'm putting more money into a machine than I had wanted to do. I'm doing internet gambling and I'm doing this and I don't want to do that person tries to cut back on something, if, they, if they're unable to do it consistently, that's when you have to have a wake-up call and say, I need to go talk to somebody about I'm this. I'm in trouble. I yep. might be in trouble. I'm, I'm addicted. Uh, I think facing that and saying that out loud is a good thing. 
Uh, let's talk about uh, entrance drugs. Uh, the people will often uh, talk about marijuana leads to this, which leads to cocaine, with opioids, all this leads, leads, leads. leads. I, we, we don't have any data on that either, do we? I mean, there there is some data out there. Um, not nothing spe uh, specific for the Department of Health, um, but you know, marijuana use, um, you know, any almost any sort of substance, um, you can can be a starting point. I feel for uh, a person uh, who you know might have some sort of addiction, or, or you know, is, is then looking for that next high, looking for for what comes afterwards. Well, and you're hanging with these kids that have access to, and there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a difficult issue. Uh, let's talk about that, uh, the, the, the trends in um, uh, binge drinking. I think we'll go back to binge drinking uh, because of the, the issue of uh, alcohol. What is binge drinking by definition, Craig? So um, it's it's having for an, a for a, a male um, having five or more drinks at a single sitting, uh, and for females it's having four or more drinks um, within a single sitting. Um, so that's that's the definition of binge drinking that we use for uh, all of our um, surveys, um, behavioral risk factor okay. surveillance, and and so on. Uh, and you know it's what we're seeing in in South Dakota is that we're about seventeen and a half percent of adults. Um, are binge drinkers. Are binge drinkers. Okay. And the more. problem with binge drinking is you have um, consequences. It might be motor vehicle accidents. It can be alcohol and toxic um, um, poisoning. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear about the college campuses where Venereal somebody dies of it. Uh, uh, STDs. STDs. STIs. Yep. STIs. Yeah. STIs. Yep. And so there's all kinds of uh, consequences that can happen with binge drinking. And so I, I commonly am asked, mm -hmm. so how much is too much? Um, there are how many glasses of wine in a bottle? Five. We know there's six beers in a six pack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in a bottle of wine, so if a person drinks a bottle of wine, a man or a woman, that is a check for being a problem. I I'll have people say, well, I was at a wine tasting party, and so yeah, I drank a whole bottle, but it was at a wine tasting party. I said, it doesn't matter in the setting. The risk factor is a risk factor. Now, mm -hmm. I asked the question for my patient over a 12 month period. So what I say is, in the last year, have you had four drinks or more if you're a female and five drinks or more as a male in one setting over a, couple, a few hours? Well, only if it's Saturday and I've gone out, out uh, fishing with the buddies, yeah, I had a six pack of beer. That's a risk factor. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's a second risk factor, and that's how much you've drank over a week period of time. The risk factor for a female is more than seven drinks in a week. For a male, it's more than 14 drinks in a week. Now, the difference between the man and the woman is to do with body water weight. Men have a higher body water weight content than women, so it's diffused more. Okay. So a woman will come up to me and says, well, I always have a glass of red wine for my heart. And yes, I've had a, I've had a bottle of um, wine in the course. I say, well, if you answer yes to both of those risk factors, you have approximately a 50 percent chance of having an alcohol related diagnosis in your lifetime. So I say what's the condition behind that? If a, if a female says to me, well my both my parents had heart attacks in their 50s and I said, well how much substance abuse? Any, any alcoholism? Any drug abuse? No, none. I'm going, well for you maybe a glass of red wine every evening would be healthy for you. Next woman comes up to me and says, yeah I'm drinking a, a Red, glass of red wine every evening. Do you have any family history of heart disease? No, no, my parents are in their 80s and they're doing fine. Uh, but they're both recovering alcoholics. I'll say, well, another story. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that glass of red wine. There is data that shows there is some familial uh, tendencies with addiction. Right. Not everybody, but, if, but when we ask to try to screen people for substance use, preoperatively we try to rescreen people. Uh, from the opioid standpoint, and one of the risk factors is, do you have a family history of a first-generation family member yeah. with addiction? Yeah. The relationship between providing needed care to a patient and their becoming addicted has many moving parts. Strides have been made in bringing some of them under control. Thankfully, in South Dakota, um, we have the second lowest overdose, overdose death rate in the country, but we're not immune. 
and even one case is tragic. Uh, doctors have done a much better job of prescribing less of them, and so prescriptions are way down. Uh, but unfortunately, overdoses are still way up, mainly because of all the, the street drugs and, and everything. But some of these people got hooked in the first place with prescription medications. You know, by far, the majority of my patients don't want to have anything to do with them. And, uh, and most people, when they do have them, use them correctly. Um, but there's, there's certain people that there's something in their brain that gets triggered and where with the reward center or something that they just can't get enough of it and they're addicted and that's the that's the saddest part about it is is they could get it for get a, a pain medication for a very legitimate reason uh but then then they 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 want more even when you know the reason should be done unfortunately you know some people might not be telling the whole story regarding their pain. And, you know, almost all the time, I, I do think they do have some pain, but is it enough to warrant still being on this dangerous medication? And so they may start to um, lie about their pain, make up injuries, do things to make it look like they've had an injury, they may lie about who they've gotten a prescription from in the past or what it was or how much it was for. They may lie about losing their medications. They may lie about uh, someone stealing their medications or losing the script. That's where, thankfully, we've made some progress in those areas by uh, having a central s website where you can go and find out, okay, what prescriptions has this person had filled, and for how much, and for when, and by whom, and uh, get alerts regarding that, or to, 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 to raise some red flags. Unfortunately, it is hard to get rid of pain medicines that are unused. Um, so many times someone might have gotten prescribed a dozen or 30 pain pills, and they only needed a few of them, and then now what do you do? And, and unfortunately, uh, people tend to, to hold on to them and hoard them. Um, for that day or in case they might need it. Unfortunately, you can't just bring it back to the pharmacy right now, and you can't just bring it back to the clinic right now, and you can't just bring it back to the hospital right now. And so we're working on it so that it would make sense that you could. Well, it, it just a beautiful answer by Andrew Ellsworth, a family physician from our, from our community. So and we've talked about different kinds of addiction. I've, we haven't spent a lot of time on cocaine, amphetamines, methamphetamines, the uppers. I mean, we've gone the narcotic or opioids. We've gone the downers with the, uh, uh, the Valiums and the benzodiazepines. But we haven't talked about the uppers. Uh, and I have heard that uh, my studies show that of all of the drugs, the mice will sit there and push the button until they're absolutely dead for the cocaine or the amphetamine or the methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just takes away all sense of, um, of sanity. I mean, it, uh, what's your take on that, Josh? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, the the use of amphetamines is, is a growing concern, uh, it, whether it's prescribed, uh, you know, from your doctor, uh, or whether we're talking about something that you're getting off of the street, such as methamphetamine. Uh, it it you're you're so connected to that um, drug and so dependent on it, uh, and unfortunately, unlike some of the other um, discussions we've had around alcohol and around opioids, the single thing that um, can kind of be done for you is looking at cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, you know, there's, there's, no there's no drug drugs. to help you off that drug. No. I, I've heard that the description of methamphetamine is that it uses up the joy that you would have had tomorrow and then you use it again and then it's tomorrow, it's the, you know, and so all of the fun and the joy in life is being pushed back to this moment. And so when you're off of it, you're anhedonic, you're, you're without joy, yeah. and it takes many, many months sometimes to find that joy again. 
It is a chronic illness. Again, it's, a, it's part of addiction. And uh, when you're dealing with that type of addiction, with that kind of a, a grasp that it has on the individual, the inpatient residential treatment facilities are absolutely essential. You know, so your treatment centers where you go for three weeks to four weeks is absolutely essential. And uh, the addiction that goes with those drugs, it also has a social aspect to it because it overtakes your life. When you get out of treatment from coming from a meth addiction or a cocaine addiction, you have to change your life in many ways, not just stop the drug. You may have to change the work you do. You may have to change the places you go. Your social your friends, friends mm -hmm. may, may change. That's asking a lot of an individual. Think of the environment that we have and the routine that we have and the comfort we have. And the circle of friends that you have. It's the same thing for the person that's in addiction, despite the addiction. Well, when they leave that addiction, no longer taking the drug, you're still vulnerable to the drug. And you still need that social support. You need that, that surrounding love that's really, really essential. So the residential treatment centers for addiction uh, are, highly variable, are, are highly valuable. We have not talked about that. And so a lot of times that's needed to kind of get a person grounded, get them off the drug. Sometimes what's called an intensive outpatient program can be effective, can be successful with, a, on top of it, cognitive behavioral therapy that type of thing, but it's, uh, again, that addiction just gets a hold of you and you doesn't know, let go. It, 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 it brings to mind, again, in my mind, uh, I've had a number of shows where we talked about the cost of health care in America. All of this money that's spent on hips and knees and uh, brain surgery and cancer therapy and whatever it might be, a lot of money, a lot of money is spent. But the money that is spent or is available for mental health is really sm much smaller. We're trying to change. There's now called value-based um, healthcare, meaning that healthcare systems are paid, uh, reimbursed by how well they take care of the patients, not by how much they take care of their patients. That's the theory. Yes. That's the future. Yes. That, that needs so to go. we do know this: if a diabetic um, is being treated for their diabetes, and if they have undiagnosed depression. Over the course of one year, the cost of care for that diabetic whose depression is not being treated is four times normal. Now, if you take that patient that has diabetes and you don't treat their depression and they have a substance use disorder, guess what the cost of care increase is? 11, 11 times, times more expensive. It does not surprise me. Because so there's a reason to invest. You know, by golly, the money that we could spend, if we spend on mental health and addiction being part of that whole bailiwick, uh, that's money well spent. Yeah. It would save our society it's lots. It's an investment, not an expense. That's right, <laughs> an investment. It's an investment. And so, I think you need to focus on having it be very much integrated with um, you know, the current you know, systems that are out there, your, your medical system. Uh, you know, what we see, uh, unfortunately, is a little bit of silo um, between the two. And it, you know, if you have somebody coming in for an appointment um, you know, and you don't have that uh, mental health professional in that same clinic, uh, it, the likelihood of them going you know, two blocks down the way um, for their mental health services uh, is, is much decreased. Uh, right. you know, you're having a lot more difficulty trying to get them in. I, I think I, I've, I've, just, I've heard that the big box stores are realizing that mental health clinics within their stores mm -hmm. are worth mm -hmm. uh, doing. I, I, my sense is that uh, we will see the, the way. There's going to be a change in health care coming. It has to be. And, uh, and they're going to realize that the, the value, the investment uh, in mental health and addiction is extremely important there. Uh, I wanted to ask about MAT. Tell me a little bit about that. MAT stands for Medicated, medic, medica, medic, Medical um, Assisted Treatment. And so what that is, is there's a drug out there called um, methadone, which is one of them. Uh, it's a, 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 long, a drug, long, long acting. acting. Yep. And then um, Suboxone is another one. Buprenorphine is the, is the generic name for that. Uh, I, I, am, I have a special DEA license that I received years ago that allows me to prescribe suboxone for addiction. It's a painkiller, and you can prescribe it as a painkiller short term. But to prescribe it as a, um, 
aberrant for addiction, you need to have a special license. And that's because there's some dangers that go with it. It's a controlled substance, and so they want extra training with that. The wonderful thing about it is it does not have the same addiction properties, so the craving that a person has um, with maybe taking a codeine or taking heroin uh, is diminished in the person that gets on MAT. So what we're doing now is we're training physicians to become MAT certified so a person who is addicted to an opioid, addicted to heroin, can come into the MAT clinic and they can be transferred from that to opioid to Suboxone. And then now you have to get don't it, have no, <laughs> but they have to be not taking the medicine, so they have to be going into withdrawal to come into the clinic to get it, and that's where it becomes somewhat complicated. Um, wonderful drug. Um, my personal preference is to get people off the opioid and on no controlled substance if possible. But there are cases out there where a person has tried and tried and has not been able to get off their opioid. They need to get on that Suboxone. It, it saves lives. I know I have had patients on it that would not be alive today. They would have had a drug overdose death if they hadn't gotten on the Suboxone. I, I have also, uh, for years, were, was part of this methadone, try to maintain yeah. type of a thing. And uh, But it is a tough drug because sometimes people will retain it and then they'll get higher and higher doses built up and then they yeah. they suffocate to death. Mm -hmm. So I my my sense is that that's a tough this methadone clinic idea tough idea. I like the idea of no opioid get them off of all of those uh, do what you can to get them involved with a different lifestyle. You know the teen challenge thing is 16 months. I mean it's mm -hmm. it's a long time mm -hmm. and and it's an amazing how they they have mentoring because these young people went their whole youth not being awake, mm -hmm. not having a chance yeah. to learn what a, a, a man should do, what kind of a protector a man should be, a, a, you know, should be responsibilities of, a, of being a, a, an adult male. I think that's something to learn. Well, we've got just like a half a minute left. Take home message, Josh. I mean, I think the biggest thing is whether you're talking about tobacco, alcohol, opioids, uh, the biggest focus is on trying to get uh, you know help as you as as early as you can get it. Um, reaching out to a family member, um, reaching out to your primary care physician, and getting into the system. Craig, one out of ten individuals in our society is at risk for addiction. That means nine out of ten are not. And what we need is those nine out of ten to say, you know what? We don't say just get over it. We say, I don't understand what you're going through. I want to help you and what can I do so that I'm not contributing to you getting back into the drugs. Very good. Thank you guys both. Thanks. Thank you. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Dot quiz question. Tobacco use in the United States is highest in the South, the Midwest, the West, the Northeast, and the answer is Midwest. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> extra, extra, read the Prairie Dog Perspectives weekly essay in your local newspaper. Over 55 newspapers across the state of South Dakota include essays written by Dr. Rick Holm covering a variety of medical and health related topics. Ask your local paper if they print Prairie Dog Perspectives. Addiction can be defined as the compulsive, repeated use of a drug or a substance such as alcohol or performance of a behavior such as gambling. Dependence is different, occurring when repeated use of a drug, such as heroin, results in physical dependence, which causes an unpleasant feeling of withdrawal when the drug is stopped. Addiction and dependence can occur separately, although they often run together. At five years old, I was a thumb sucker. I recall not being proud of it as my folks seemed progressively upset about my addiction. The process that finally helped me quit was when I was told I would not visit my grandmother in Minneapolis until I stopped sucking my thumb. I remember many struggled attempts at quitting before I finally shook the monkey off my back. Addiction is a human condition that can affect any one of us. The people in this country are currently caught in a terrible maelstrom of opioid addiction. 
from which human beings of all ages, races, and economic status seem unable to escape. Twice as many people suffocated to death from opioids last year than died of vehicular crashes. Something like 23.5 million people in the United States, about one in every 10 over the age of 12, are addicted to alcohol, drugs, or something. Of those addicted, only one in 10 will ever get help. One expert states that the financial and emotional toll of addiction is greater than the combined consequences of diabetes mellitus and all cancers put together. Think of all of the lung disease and cancer that results from smoking, the cirrhosis and liver failure as well as the dementia that results from alcohol, the dental problems from methamphetamine use, and all the social consequences of addiction, including accidental vehicular crashes, suicides, homicides, criminal behavior, and an incarceration. Despite all this doomsday talk, I think we have room for hope if we realize that none of us are immune and everyone should take precautions. We should start with an open-eyed and honest approach with our youth teaching the truth about addiction without making addictive behaviors a forbidden fruit. Our country desperately needs affordable addiction and mental health treatment options available to all without the negative stigma and often unhelpful incarceration that can follow. Spending for prevention and treatment of addiction would save us all significantly more than it would cost. We also need more research to better understand addiction and what influences addictive behavior, even that is seemingly benign as sucking one's thumb. We spend 75% of our time interestingly mm -hmm. enough. And a big thank you to our guests, Craig and Joshua, for volunteering to come to our studio in Jaeger Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University. The experience they wrought was key to the important questions we are addressing. Well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. and then we get to talk among ourselves. From aspirin to opioids and everything in between, benefits and side effects from drugs, making it balance. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. All of us want our family, neighbors, and friends to have the ability to make appropriate decisions about their health care. To do so, they need access to information from reliable sources, like Dr. Holm and his guest physicians. Hello, I'm Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and I serve on the volunteer board of directors of the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 organization established to support the work of the Prairie Docs. With your charitable donation, you can help the foundation continue to offer free and easy access to the entire library of Prairie Doc health education programs. This mission is so very important to rural communities and residents in particular across South Dakota and neighboring states. Please consider a personal or corporate gift. Just go to prairiedoc.org to find more information on how you can help. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. 
and with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Avera Heart Hospital. Dakota Allergy and Asthma. CoBank. Fishback Financial Corporation. Vance Thompson Vision. Urology Specialists. Brown Clinic. Black Hills Medical Society. Aberdeen District Medical Society. Third District Medical Society. Seventh District Medical Society. Dakota Bank. Orthopedic Institute. Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. And Swiftel Communications.